So, uh, today I am going to um, talk about uh, reconstructive transformations uh, beginning with uh, the ferrite transformation which happens at the highest temperature when you cool austenite uh, below the A3 temperature. And there are two kinds of uh, ferrite that we will discuss. <coughs> One is called allotriomorphic ferrite. Now, the word allotriomorph means that the shape of the transformation product does not reflect its internal crystalline symmetry. And the reason is that this ferrite nucleates at the austenite grain boundaries and that provides an easy diffusion path. So, it grows along those austenite grain boundaries and forms a layer uh, rather than forming the crystallographic facets. Uh, and the shape here is not controlled by strain energy etcetera. So, it is able to grow right across austenite grain boundaries unlike martensite, bainite and Wiedmerstein ferrite. You know when you have a disciplined motion of atoms you cannot uh, grow across a change in crystallographic orientation in other words across a grain boundary. But reconstructive transformations are not limited by any defects they can consume those defects. Now, idiomorphic ferrite uh, is ferrite which is intragranularly nucleated perhaps on particles of uh, dirt you know manganese sulphide inclusions etcetera. Uh, and because it is not in contact with the austenite grain surfaces it develops crystallographic facets. Okay. So, these are reconstructive transformations and they cannot happen at low temperatures and in the context of steel low temperature is below about 600 degrees centigrade uh, and require diffusion over the length scale of the transformation product of all atoms okay, iron atoms as well as uh, carbon atoms. And this is what uh, allotriomorphic ferrite looks like um, you have come across this many times I am sure these are layers of ferrite uh, because the ferrite nucleates at austenite grain surfaces is heterogeneous nucleation and they look completely clean again there is no internal structure within those layers of ferrite it is just grains growing and consuming the austenite and destroying any defects in their path. And this is a, a steel with a low carbon concentration, this is a steel with a high carbon concentration where the growth rate is slower and therefore, you get thin layers of ferrite at the austenite grain surfaces the rest of it is perlite. Now, I have said to you that we consume about 1.4 billion tons of steel every year and the vast majority of steels will contain this kind of ferrite all right, because it is only the specialized steels where we require very high strength uh, and we base them on martensite or bainite. The vast majority of structural steels are based on ferrite. This is a micrograph again showing you the allotriomorphs of austenite, but in addition you can see these intragranularly nucleated particles of ferrite which are the idiomorphs and they clearly are faceted. Okay. Now, notice that the austenite grain size here is huge because remember again we are looking at two dimensional sections. Okay. Uh, so, this particle which we claim is intragranularly nucleated could arise from something grow uh, a grain boundary under the image. right? But if you have a large austenite grain size you can be pretty sure that that particle in the middle is actually intragranular nucleated. And indeed in order to get intragranular nucleation you need to have a large austenite grain size otherwise the most favorable site for nucleation is always the austenite grain surface. Okay. Uh, now, there are advantages in having idiomorphic ferrite instead of allotriomorphic ferrite because uh, once again you get deflection of, uh, crystal, uh, of uh, cleavage cracks as you go across those whereas, these tend to be large regions in the same crystallographic orientation. So, ignore the intragranular plates that is intragranular uh, intragranular nucleated Wiedmannstaden ferrite. Okay. <coughs> okay, so, um, this is a reconstructive transformation and you have seen uh, now I think three different videos showing you surface relief developing when we form martensite, bainite and uh, Wiedmannstein ferrite. So, supposing I polish 
austenite completely flat and allow it to transform to allotriomorphic uh, ferrite, what should I see on the surface? Nothing, right? So this is going to be an extremely boring movie to watch, but it's worth watching just to show that there's nothing happening. And again, the red indicates the temperature, so it's about 780 at this moment. And by about 720, you know, the transformation to ferrite is completed. <coughs> and of course, because there's no surface relief and we are not etching the sample, you may not actually be able to see anything but the very faint uh, features when the ferrite forms. Oops. Okay, so you can see the temperature dropping now. And the minute contrast changes will happen near the austenite grain boundaries. Okay, you may not see them without watching the movie several times. So therefore, you know, the only change uh, to the surface that we, will, we, we should see is purely due to the volume change. There's no shear deformation involved at all. Uh, you know, the temperature is now 755 and this is a 0.15 carbon alloy. So we should have formed ferrite by now. And because of the absence of any shear deformation, you also don't have the vast strain energy that's associated with the invariant plane strain shape deformation. Okay, so there's nothing there to see in terms of surface relief. Uh, if I um, If I do that, can you, can you see in this region uh, a small change in contrast? Yeah? That's the ferrite growing, okay? <laughs> so, so diffusional uh, transformations which involve a lot of diffusion, strain energy uh, is absent, and this is much closer to equilibrium transformations than any of the displacive transformations that we've uh, studied. <coughs> So, you know, even a negative experiment is important to show you that not all transformations have the shape change and this <coughs> truly involves long-range diffusion. So, we have these thin layers of ferrite at the austenite uh, grain boundaries and we want to work out the kinetics of the growth of those layers. Um, we don't want these layers to be too coarse because there's no structure in them. And therefore, you know, if you have a large region of, uh, of ferrite without any structure in it, then you basically get un uh, cleavage cracks propagating without any deflection at all, right? So, I want you to close your notes, right? And we want to work through this because we've done this partly in the last lecture, how to treat diffusion control growth. But this is a different problem. We are not talking about a plate growing but a one-dimensional growth of a layer of ferrite. One-dimensional means it's growing, uh, growing um, only in uh, the direction normal to the layer, okay? So I'm switching to the document camera. How would I start to calculate, how would I set up the problem for working out the thickening rate of that layer of ferrite? Okay, so how do we go about treating the diffusion controlled growth of this layer. Uh, we did this in the last lecture and it will be useful to do this without looking at your notes. So what's the first thing that we need to do? Um, we basically need to define the conditions at the interface. So if I look at my phase diagram where I'm plotting temperature versus composition and I have the phase boundaries here where this is the alpha phase field, this is the gamma phase field, 
we have a composition C bar and we are operating at this temperature. So that gives me the equilibrium composition in the austenite, which we label C gamma alpha, and the equilibrium composition in the ferrite, which we label as C alpha gamma. So the austenite cannot accommodate more than this much carbon when it's in equilibrium with ferrite. So the concentration profile at the interface will look something like this, uh, where we are plotting a coordinate Z and concentration on the vertical axis. And we will have a profile of concentration which looks like this. The far field composition is given by C bar. This is C gamma alpha. And here we have C alpha gamma. So this is ferrite and this is austenite. So there are two conditions which we need to define. Uh, the first one is that the rate of solute partitioning uh, is equal to the rate at which solute is carried away by diffusion along this gradient, because otherwise this limiting concentration would change. So we can write that the rate of solute partitioning is C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma into dz star by dt, where z star is the position of the interface. In other words, the thickness of the layer of ferrite. And that must be equal to minus the diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration, which we can approximate as the diffusion coefficient times c gamma alpha minus c bar, that means this minus this, divided by this diffusion distance here, which is delta Z, okay. divided by delta Z. So this term represents the rate at which solute is partitioned, and this term the rate at which solute is taken away from the interface by diffusion. And those two terms are equal if we are to maintain local equilibrium at the interface. So the only unknown in this equation is delta Z. And the way in which we obtain delta Z is we use mass balance. So here, for example, the total amount of uh, carbon that is uh, partitioned from the ferrite is this. And the total amount that has been rejected into the austenite is this. Therefore, uh, C bar minus C alpha gamma into Z star must be equal to C gamma alpha minus C bar minus C bar into delta Z over 2 because this is the area of this triangle. So we now have an equation for delta Z which can be substituted into this and the problem is solved. Okay, so we've got our equilibrium phase diagram and that tells us the concentration of carbon which will be in austenite that is in equilibrium with ferrite. And therefore we can write an equation which says that the rate at which we partition carbon must be equal to the rate at which uh, it's taken away from the interface by diffusion, Fix's law, so that we maintain C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma constant because those compositions represent equilibrium between ferrite and austenite, so local equilibrium at the interface. And the rate at which solid is partitioned, you know, if you just imagine that concentration profile is displaced a little bit, then you can see that the shaded red region here is the amount of solute that is partitioned when the interface moves uh, a little bit. And therefore, that equation, which is this minus this um, multiplied by the rate at which the interface moves, is the rate of solute partitioning. And that must be carried away from the interface by diffusion. And we are left with the problem of solving for the diffusion distance. Okay? Now, in the case of Wiedemann-Staden ferrite, 
uh, you've got carbon being left behind the tip. Okay? So you're not actually accumulating carbon at the tip of the plate. It's advancing into fresh austenite. So we made the approximation that that diffusion distance is roughly the tip radius. If you tried to do a mass balance here, uh, you wouldn't actually be looking at the lengthening of the plate, but you would be looking at the thickening of the plate because the carbon is being left behind. And the thickening of the plate will be as for parabolic, as we will just uh, show shortly for the thickening of the layer of ferrite. It's the lengthening rate which is constant. Okay? In the case of a layer of ferrite, everything is accumulating in front of the interface. Okay? So the diffusion distance will grow as more ferrite forms because you are basically partitioning more and more carbon into the austenite. Is everyone happy with this? <coughs> okay, so um, we look at the mass balance in order to get uh, delta Z because absolutely all the carbon is ending up ahead of the interface. So we balance those areas, we get delta Z and we substitute for delta Z into um, ouch, yeah, the staple just uh, yeah. <laughs> actually at one point I, I asked for better staples you know they said look this is all we have take it or leave it you know <coughs> okay so going back to this uh, mass balance we solve for delta Z and substitute into the equation for the rate at which solute is partitioned equal to the diffusion flux from the interface and we obtain our growth rate equation that the growth rate will be a function of quantities from the phase diagram, the average composition of the steel and the diffusion coefficient of carbon in austenite and you know you've got a dz star at the top and then if I take this Z star onto this side, then you can see that when I integrate, I will get Z star is proportional to the square root of time. Okay? Because you know dz star times Z star will integrate as Z star squared, right? Okay? So the thickness will vary parabolically with time. All right? Now have you come across this anywhere before? Yeah, in what context? Oxidation. Oxidation, exactly. Because, you know, as the oxide grows, the oxygen has to diffuse uh, through thicker and thicker layers, all right? Or, or the metal has to diffuse to the surface through thicker and thicker layers. And therefore, the diffusion distance increases and the growth rate slows down with time. So here, this is what uh, uh, the uh, equations would look uh, when you plot them, the equations would be parabolic and you can see that the slope of that curve is decreasing with time. In other words, the growth rate is decreasing with time. Everyone happy with? Okay, so this is an interesting uh, uh, graph where I'm changing the carbon concentration by equal amounts, all right? So, you know, 0 0.11 minus 0 0.09 is 0 0.02 and 0 0.05 minus 0 0.03 is also 0 0.02. Why then is the growth rate becoming very sensitive to carbon at low carbon concentrations? Very good. So, so which term in the equation at the bottom? Uh, no, uh, yeah, but it's C bar minus C alpha gamma is becoming smaller and smaller and therefore the growth rate is increasing dramatically. All right? So, you know, if, if uh, the carbon concentration equals the solubility, there's no partitioning at all. There's no accumulation of carbon in the austenite and the growth rate should go to infinity. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't because we've never seen ferrite grow at an infinite rate even in zero carbon iron. Yeah? So what happens is that other rate controlling processes take over. For example, the transfer of atoms across the interface and so on. The theory that we've done is purely when growth is controlled by diffusion. Okay? So you'll never get to uh, you know, infinite growth rates, but they will become much more rapid 
when the carbon concentration in your alloy approaches the solubility of carbon in ferrite. Now this is really important because in order to get toughness in structural steels, that means you know bridges and so forth which are welded, you always aim for low carbon concentration. So 0.05 carbon is typical. So if you make your steel with 0.04 carbon instead of 05, that makes a big difference to the structure. So these huge quantities of steel are produced to very accurate concentrations. You know, even if you are producing a hundred million tons, you have to control the concentrations to that sort of accuracy. Okay? And that's done. It's amazing technology actually. If you go into a steel plant, you'll hardly see human beings, you know. It's so automated and reproducible. Okay, um, as you said, same theory applies to oxides. And here, for example, we have um, uh, iron silicon and oxygen reacting to produce oxide. As the oxide gets thicker, our diffusion distance becomes larger and larger, and therefore the thickening rate is parabolic. There can be complications, for example, that the density of the oxide is different from that of the metal, so eventually it pulls away, breaks away from the surface, and then the whole thing starts again, like in copper oxide. You know, you get parabolic, but linear if you add all the parabolas up, yeah, because the oxide breaks away from the surface. This is uh, an image published by NASA. It's obviously a schematic, but it's uh, the, the moon uh, Europa which is the moon of uh, Jupiter, which has uh, an almost continuous layer of ice on the surface uh, with water underneath. And, you know, the thickening of ice will depend on heat flow through the ice, okay, from the warmer water to the surface. And therefore, that is also parabolic with time. And that's why, you know, it takes a very long time before a pond would completely freeze. Okay, so, you won't find ponds freezing in winter in Britain. Uh, you, you would need a very, very long time because it, the whole growth rate, uh, thickening rate of the ice slows down as time proceeds. So, that in this case, it's heat diffusion that's doing that. And uh, when we do soldering of electronic components and so forth, uh, you get a reaction between the copper and the solder which creates intermetallic compounds. And again, the thickening rate of those intermetallic compounds is parabolic with time, because you are reacting tin in the solder with the copper, and the diffusion distance increases between the copper and the solder. Okay? So, the parabolic kinetics apply to many, many scenarios in material science, not just uh, to steels. All this is really important because uh, the intermetallic compounds tend to be relatively brittle, right? So, you know, even when we galvanize steel, you get a reaction between zinc and the substrate, which produces intermetallic compounds. So, you have to control things so that those intermetallic compounds are not harmful to the coating. Okay? okay um, the physical reason why the growth rate slows down with time is that the diffusion distance increases. So, when the ferrite la layer is thin, we have partitioned less carbon into the austenite than when the ferrite layer is thick. So, that's the physical reason why we get parabolic thickening. Now, we made uh, quite a few approximations in, in uh, deriving that equation. And the first one is that the far field composition does not change, C bar is constant. Okay? But if you have uh, two layers of ferrite approaching each other, that will no longer be the case. C bar, you know, you will build up concentration in the middle. What do you expect then to happen? Uh, you know, you have got a parabolic thickening, what do you expect? what sort of a deviation do you expect from parabolic thickening? Yeah, 
So the growth rate will reduce because if C bar increases, then basically you are reducing the growth rate, right? And when C bar, when will it become zero? When in the middle you've achieved the equilibrium composition of the austenite, right? Okay. Uh, so that's uh, uh, an approximation, and that doesn't mean that the ferrite layers have touched each other. Okay, it simply means that the concentration of carbon in the austenite has reached a value higher than C bar. So we call this soft impingement. So the particles haven't touched each other, but they are still influencing each other through their diffusion fields. Okay, and uh, of course we've already. Uh, noted that you know if if C bar becomes the solubility of carbon in ferrite then the growth rate doesn't go to infinity because other rate controlling processes for example the transfer of atoms across the interface become rate limiting okay and um, one dimensional growth that means thickening of layers so if you were treating the growth rate of an idiomorph it would be more complicated because you aren't getting diffusion in just one direction but in three directions okay but the theory for this exists all of all the theory for one two three dimensional growth growth involving soft impingement etc exists but the essence of what we've done doesn't change very much okay everyone happy with that so these are the assumptions we made in deriving those equations Okay, now I'm just going to lead you on now into uh, not the next lecture but the one after that, right? Because so far we've only dealt with iron carbon alloys, all right? And there is no steel I know of which only contains carbon as an alloying element, all right? So, you know, you can throw in other elements. What is the consequence on growth theory, right? So this is the equilibrium phase diagram and we have a tie line which gives us the equilibrium compositions of the parent and product phases and it's a binary system so there's a unique tie line at a given temperature okay and the way in which we get that tie line is by drawing a common tangent i just want to remind you of why we draw the common tangent okay so you know it is actually bizarre that you've got ferrite with less carbon which is in equilibrium with austenite with more carbon Fix's law tells you you know you should get diffusion of carbon from austenite to ferrite so why doesn't it do that why doesn't carbon if you think about it it's bizarre right because you accept Fix's law of diffusion and yet you say okay two phases in contact can have different composition hmm? Sorry? Yeah, so, so we need to express that uh, in thermodynamics, right? So imagine that you have a free energy curve for one of the phases, right? Uh, alpha or gamma, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that I've got uh, a particular composition X here. Uh, so we have <coughs> X of B in this alloy, and I draw a tangent, right? I just feel like drawing a tangent. And I label these points as mu naught A and mu naught B, and this one as mu B and mu A. And this is the free energy of an alloy of composition X. Now, I can write an equation for this straight line that G of X uh, is mu A times 1 minus X, because that's the concentration of A, plus mu B times X, which is the concentration of B. That's just, just writing an equation for G. Yeah, everyone happy about that? So it's the weighted mean of mu A and mu B. What you've done is you've separated the free energy of a solution of composition X into something due to A and something due to B. Because mu A is called the chemical potential of A, right? And the concentration of A is 1 minus X. And mu B is the chemical potential of B. And uh, X is the amount of B. So chemical potential is simply the contribution to the free energy of the solution from A or B atoms. Okay? Yeah, everyone happy with that? So you can think about 
mu b as the mean free energy of b atoms in a solution of this composition. If I change the composition, mu b and mu a will change. So it's it's not a constant. Yeah. So we've separated the free energy into the contribution from A atoms and the contribution from B atoms. So if I now draw a common tangent to free energy curves, then the free energy of iron in alpha is the same as the free energy of iron in gamma, and the free energy of carbon in alpha is the same as the free energy of carbon in gamma. So there's no driving force for diffusion. Yeah. That's why this gives you the equilibrium compositions. And diffusion is not strictly driven by concentration differences, but by free energy differences. Okay? You've come across that before, haven't you? Yes, so everyone happy with that concept? So to find equilibrium, the free energies of all the components uh, should be identical in both phases. So even if their compositions are different, there's no driving force for diffusion. Okay, now uh, let's extend this to a ternary system. Uh, so we have iron, manganese, and carbon now. There's nothing special. Free energy curves become free energy surfaces, right? So th those, uh, these are supposed to be surfaces, but they are difficult to draw in three dimensions. But they're basically like this, yeah? Okay. And to find equilibrium, we have a tangent plane, which is touching both those free energy surfaces, okay? And where it touches defines a tie line because the free energy of all the components is then identical in both the phases, right? Now, can you see that the tie line is no longer unique? Because, you know, I can rock that tangent plane and still maintain contact with the free energy surfaces, right? So you can generate an infinite set of tie lines at a constant temperature which define the alpha plus gamma phase field. Because we have a third component, we have an extra degree of freedom, and you can have an, a series of tie lines defining equilibrium between alpha and gamma at a constant temperature. Yeah. You happy with that? So that alpha plus gamma phase field, so this is a ternary section of the uh, phase diagram here at the bottom is a ternary section where we have an alpha phase field, we have a gamma phase field, and alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature, because these free energy plots are all for a constant temperature. Everyone happy with that? You know, you, you have a tangent plane, you, let's say you have two footballs here, you can rock that tangent plane and still maintain contact. Yeah? So you no longer have a choice of just one tie line, as you had in the binary, you have a choice of many tie lines, yeah? And still maintain equilibrium at the interface. Now, why is this uh, important? That's, uh, that's just plotting that diagram out again, uh, except I'm using a square plot instead of a triangular plot. Uh, where we have an alpha fe phase field, gamma phase field, and we're plotting manganese and carbon. This is the theory that we used to derive uh, diffusion control growth equations, that the rate at which solute is partitioned must be equal to the rate at which it's carried away from the interface by diffusion. And this is for a binary case. If we have more than one component, then we actually have two equations to satisfy. Yeah? So this, for example, uh, the subscript 1 could refer to carbon, and that's the diffusion coefficient of carbon, and that's the diffusion coefficient, or uh, sorry, the concentration gradient of carbon. And this is the corresponding term for manganese, V is the velocity, and diffusion coefficient of manganese, and the gradient of manganese. And both of those equations uh, need to be satisfied simultaneously. Okay. Now, there is a further complication, uh, is that I could actually add another term here, which is d12 times the gradient of 2. In other words, you know, does the gradient of manganese influence the diffusion of carbon? <coughs> 
left. Yeah? So if I have a completely homogeneous carbon concentration but a gradient of manganese, should the carbon diffuse? And the answer is yes, because you know the concentration of manganese will influence the chemical potential of carbon. All right? Do you know of any other scenario like that where you know the flux of something influences the flux of something else? So think about thermocouples. All right? You know, you have a heat flux, you have a temperature difference, which is driving an electrical current, right? So we'll we'll do some of that theory in the next lecture. And you know, the title of the lecture will sound complicated, but it's actually very simple. So we will deal with irreversible thermodynamics in the next lecture, which is a theory between equi uh, thermo equilibrium thermodynamics and kinetics. Okay? Okay, so we'll end the lecture here today.